Uh, thank you, Hans. Uh, before I start, let me mention one thing. Today, uh, this article appeared on Mises Daily. Uh, well, yesterday, but this is the current issue. So it's, it, this is a summary of the Hoppian argumentation ethics theory. So uh, anyone who's interested in this idea, you may want to take a look at this. Um, also, at the bottom of this page, there's an ad for uh, an upcoming Mises Academy course I have here, which is starting July 11th, um, The Social Theory of Hoppe. So it's a, a six-week course where I'll go into detail um, on Professor Hoppe's uh, economic and political theories. So anyone who, who's interested in that, uh, take a look. I've taught two, um, well, three uh, Mises Academy courses already, uh, my intellectual property theory twice, and uh, uh, libertarian legal theory. And in the course of doing these and in the course of my thinking over the years, I've started to collect um, a bunch of libertarian fallacies, confusions, and misconceptions, which I'll try to uh, go through here. And if you disagree with me, I guess I'm promoting some libertarian misconceptions. Um, so I'll start with a fairly easy one um, that's always sort of bugged me. Uh, you'll find libertarians will use the word coercion quite often as a synonym for aggression. We're against coercion. Um, this is more of a semantic point, but um, technically we're not against coercion. Coercion just means to use force to compel someone to do something. Um, so if someone's breaking into my house and I, I get my gun and I force them to leave, I'm coercing the guy, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so I think we just need to be clear on our terminology and avoid um, equating aggression with coercion. And libertarians will also, in, in like things, sometimes say um, that we're against violence or we're against force. And of course we're not. We're only against the unjustified um, use of force. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a PowerPoint slide, and I have tons of links in here. And I posted this on my website this morning, if anyone wants to look it up and uh, look for a – I've often got links to articles or blog posts that have further discussion of the topics uh, in this slide. Um, and my website is <coughs> Stefan Kinsella. Com. Um, by the way, in a like vein, I always get annoyed when people use the word capital L libertarians to describe me or other libertarians. Um, libertarian with a capital L means member of the Libertarian Party, to my mind, and I've never been a member of the Libertarian Party and don't plan to be, although I did run for office one time uh, under the Libertarian ticket um, in Texas. Um, a related idea is uh, you'll hear this idea when people talk about uh, PDAs, private defense agencies, an anarchist or private property society. Um, a lot of these guys uh, uh, are almost sound pacifist in the sense that um, they, they say that you can only assert jurisdiction over someone who's already signed up to be a customer of one of these uh, competing PDAs who have agreements with each other. Um, but of course I think that's false. Uh, a criminal, in, a, in effect, uh, consents to jurisdiction over him by committing an act of aggression. Um, so you can think of it this way. There are two ways that uh, force can be justified against someone. Uh, that is, invading the borders of their body, using their body or their property. One would be per consent, right? If someone gives permission or invites them, like a girl invites you to kiss her. Uh, it's not aggression because it's invited or consented to. Uh, but committing aggression would be another way uh, that you can think of as giving a type of consent to force being used against your body. Um, and the reason basically is sort of the, the Hoppian argumentation ethics or symmetrical idea that um, you, you really have no grounds for objecting to force being used against your body if you are committing aggression yourself. You sort of agreed to that type of rule of ethics. So these are some kind of initial ones. Uh, <clears throat> let's get into another one. Uh, restitution and punishment or retribution. These two things are, are often confused by libertarians. They're all over the map. Some people believe retribution is primary. Some think restitution is primary. Uh, some think we should have both. Um, now, my view on this one is that um, the general libertarian view is that we're for non-aggression. But what that means is force that is not aggression is not impermissible. What, the, what that means is force that's in response to aggression is what is uh, permissible. So I think the general category of what type of force is permissible is responsive force. Now that includes different types of force. 
That includes defense, using force in self-defense because that's in response to aggression, uh, or using force to achieve restitution after the fact, uh, or using force to incapacitate someone uh, or to punish them for deterrence purposes or even for rehabilitation. All these are examples of responsive force. Um, so the purpose or the motive of the victim who is using his right to retaliate, his right to respond forcefully against an aggressor, that is what determines the, character, the characteristic of that force. Um, so he might have a, he might have a, 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 he might want vengeance, he might want retribution, uh, or he might want to uh, threaten the victim, I'm uh, sorry, threaten the aggressor and say, uh, you know, I have the right to torture you or to jail you or to uh, kill you even for the crime you committed, but I'll bargain it away for an award of money, restitution. Um, so the purpose that, that the victim can put his right to punish or his right to respond forcefully to uh, determines the type, but it's up to him. Uh, now, so I, I would disagree with the idea that uh, there's restitution is the only uh, basis of a libertarian society because there is a right to respond with force to an aggressor. He basically is his rights are not violated if an aggressor is uh, is a uh, his force his force is used against him or in response to his aggression. Uh, however, this does not mean that in a libertarian society restitution would not be the dominant mode of justice, and I actually think it probably would. Uh, there are several reasons for this. Uh, number one is that punishment is more costly than restitution. Uh, there's always the possibility of error. If you make an error in an award of restitution, then that can be undone. If you make an error in, in, um, in punishment, it can never be undone, and it could lead to retaliation against you or uh, a, high award of, a high award of damages from your insurance company or something like that. Um, another reason it's more costly is it is probable that the standard of proof would be higher to justify punishing um, an accused aggressor than to, um, than to get restitution. Uh, arguably, you would need proof way beyond a reasonable doubt to justify punishing, whereas it may only be a preponderance of the evidence standard uh, for um, getting restitution because there the dispute is just over property. Basically, you're saying this uh, purported aggressor, this alleged aggressor, has $10,000. I claim that I am entitled to that money for damages for restitution to me. So it's really a property dispute at that point. And in a property dispute, um, while the, the burden of proof can be on the, the plaintiff, which would be the victim, the standard of proof could be just preponderance of uh, evidence. And if, for people who aren't familiar, this is a legal standard. Preponderance of the evidence is basically more likely than not, 51%. Um, and you can think of uh, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt is 99%. And there's an intermediate standard in the U.S. called clear and convincing, which is, I don't know, 75%. Um, and there are several other reasons that restitution would probably be the dominant mode of justice, although punishment, you could imagine, would happen on occasion in an ad hoc fashion, even in an institutional fashion. Um, another reason that we need to uh, keep in mind that there is a right to punish is that without the right to punish, restitution, except in cases of property theft, is fairly arbitrary. Um, if there's rape or murder or assault or kidnapping, uh, that can never be undone, and an award of money never truly compensates the victim for the crime that was done. And so there is just no objective way to determine how much money the aggressor should have to pay. And in fact, in most cases, aggressors um, um, are usually low lives and don't have any money anyway. So um, you need the right to punishment to, ha uh, to determine the proper amount of uh, a restitution. So for example, if you know that you have the right to punish uh, an aggressor proportionally for the crime you committed, the worse the crime, the more severe the punishment could in theory be inflicted, then that amount of punishment could be used to bargain with the aggressor for a, a more objective restitution award. And in fact, this also solves the, the rich aggressor problem where um, people have said that if you just have a restitution award, then you know, Bill Gates can go around murdering because he can just pay off the $3 million uh, set penalty for, uh, for murder. Uh, but that actually would not be the case because the aggressors, the victim's families would have the right to punish Bill Gates. And because he's a billionaire, um, he would maybe pay $50 billion, half of his fortune, to avoid being punished. 
Um, so there's a sort of sliding scale there that comes into play. Um, so the right to punishment helps to make restitution more objective and helps solve the, the rich aggressor problem. Um, it's often said that libertarianism um, uh, believes that there are no such things as positive obligations, that we only believe in negative obligations. And typically what they mean is the, um, the correlative idea of um, the only duty we have is to avoid aggression. That is, you have to refrain from committing aggression, which means don't trespass, don't in, invade others' borders, um, and don't use people's property without their consent. Um, but I think this is actually uh, uh, mistaken. Libertarianism does not uh, oppose positive obligations. Um, it's just that they have to be voluntarily assumed. Um, so for example, if you commit crime, then you have by that action, you have acquired a positive obligation to, uh, say, make restitution to the victim. Uh, if you commit a negligent act or even an intentional act like a tort, like you push someone in a lake, especially if they can't swim, you do have a duty to rescue that person. Uh, you have a duty to mitigate the, the damage you've already done. Uh, whereas a passing by stranger does not have a, a legal duty to rescue a drowning stranger. He may have a moral duty, I think he probably does, but doesn't have a legal duty, but, um, but the aggressor or the tortfeasor does. Um, other actions can also give rise to positive obligations, uh, in, my, in my view. Uh, for example, having a child gives rise to parental obligations. Now, they may be difficult to enforce, but in, in theory, I do believe that there are legal obligations of parents to children, at least to a certain age, uh, and I do discuss this in, um, in one of my articles. Now, uh, some ask whether this, uh, how this uh, relates to the issue of abortion and I won't get into that here, but you could, you could make arguments one way or the other. Uh, now, what about just by mouthing words, by saying things? Does that give rise to positive obligations? Um, most people would think so because of a sort of standard mainstream understanding of what contracts are. Most people think of contracts as um, binding obligations, binding promises. So you make a promise, and therefore it's enforceable. Um, this is problematic under libertarian theory for several reasons, and it is best explained by uh, Murray Rothbard and Williamson Evers, who have written a lot on this issue. Basically, they start from a propertarian perspective. The only right, as Rothbard argued, uh, are property rights. Even the rights in your body can be viewed as property rights. Um, and so the fundamental right is the right to control uh, exclusively scarce resources that you've appropriated or come to own in some kind of way. So a contract is simply viewed as an exercise of one of your ownership rights, that is alienating the title to some property that you own. So a contract is not a binding promise. It is rather a title transfer. Um, this may seem like just a minor semantic difference, but it's not. It has lots of implications. Um, it's a much more clear way to, to view this whole area, and it has implications for inalienability, for example, which, which I'll get to uh, later if I have time. Um, uh, I also think that libertarians who say that there's free speech rights, for example, there actually, as Rothbard explains, there are no free speech rights. There are no uh, freedom of the press rights. There are only property rights, the property right in your body. You can think of a couple of examples where um, uh, to show that there are no fr free speech rights, for example. Um, so in one, in one example, if I own my body, then I'm free to use it to say words. So owning my body is sufficient to give me the right to speak. So the right to free speech is really a consequence or an implication of my more fundamental right to my body. So if you say there's a right to my body and a free speech right, you're double counting. Uh, so it's redundant. It's not necessary to say there's a right to free speech. On the other hand, if you're on someone else's property, you have to abide by their rules. You may not speak on someone else's property uh, if they don't permit you to. So the right to free speech, if it existed, would trump their property rights. So it, it, it doesn't exist in that case either. Um, and furthermore, there are cases where speech, and this is my opinion, a lot of libertarians would disagree. Um, uh, even Rothbard has this view in Walter Block that incitement, for example, can never be a crime. Um, or that, uh, say, a mafia boss or someone like that is only liable for the actions of his henchmen or other people who perform the direct crime uh, if there's a contract or if there is coercion. Um, so, for example, Walter would say that uh, Truman was implicitly coercing the the bomber and the, the pilot of the, of the Enola Gay who bombed uh, uh, Japan. Um, but of course, that is not always the case. Um, there's not always coercion. 
um, and I still think there's liability. Um, I discuss this in more detail in the article linked at the bottom of this page, but uh, in my view, we need to have a more general view of causation. We have to anchor it in the Misesian praxeological structure of human action. We have to understand human action is um, the intentional use of means to achieve an end. That is what human action is. Um, and the use of a means is using something causally efficacious in the world to achieve the intended end. And these means can, can be other human beings. Um, as Mises uh, explicitly discusses in human action with regard to economics and the division of labor, of course other humans in cooperative action can be our means um, to achieve our ends. Um, now this, another misconception of libertarianism uh, some libertarians make is uh, they seem to have this uh, fixed pie responsibility mentality where they're afraid to say that the, uh, the mafia boss who gives an order or, or let's take a better example. A wife who seduces her boyfriend or promises him sexual favors and persuades her boyfriend to kill her husband so she gets the insurance money and gets rid of him. Um, say Walter Block would have to say that she's not liable in that case because there's no contract uh, and there's no coercion. Um, but of course I think that's nonsense. Some libertarians would be afraid to say the wife is liable in this case because they think that that means 100% of the responsibility falls on her and the, the boyfriend is now exculpated. But of course this is not true. There's such a thing as joint responsibility, and I think they're both 100% responsible in that case. Um, uh, cooperative crimes are possible. Um, and in this case, if you look at the structure of the wife's action, her end was the death of her husband, which is a crime. The means she selected was persuading her boyfriend. So it fits perfectly into the Misesian structure of action. Uh, so the point is, in some cases, speech can be the means of aggression. So imagine the, um, the firing squad captain, and he says, ready, aim, fire. Uh, now Walter might say, Walter Block might say that he's, uh, he's, not, he's not shooting the, the victim of the, uh, of, the, of, of the firing squad. He's just saying words. Uh, I think this is just a, um, 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 a too simplistic view of the reality of human interaction and cooperation. Uh, likewise, you stir up a crowd, you say lynch him, and you get your way, and the crowd lynches this innocent victim, I think you're, you're responsible. Now there are obviously limits, and this is the job of, of, of judges and juries and legal science to, to figure out the limits, but we can't just say there's a bright line rule that speech is never aggression. Um, also I think that um, the one way to view th this problem, uh, you know, imagine you're in a bar and you walk up to, some guy walks up to a big burly biker and he just looks at him and says, your mama's ugly. Now, some libertarians would say, well, you know, if the biker punches him in the face, then that's aggression. You know, even though the guy was asking for it, even though, even though the guy's doing something risky and maybe immoral, um, technically the biker is committing aggression. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think in that context, you're basically inviting a fight. So by the words, your mama's ugly, you, you know you're going to anger this guy, you know he's going to punch you, and you're standing there ready to receive it. So it's similar to stepping into a boxing ring or, or onto the, um, um, uh, the, rugby, the rugby field. You know, you're, you're consenting to the, 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 the fight. Uh, but anyway, this is an example of how uh, there can be positive obligations assumed by word as well. So I mentioned already um, the contract issue. Um, the confusion that contracts should be viewed as binding promises, but instead, as, as I mentioned, Rothbard and Evers argue, they should be just viewed as exchanges. Um, now, one related thing to this um, uh, is uh, uh, this has implications for the body, alienability in the body. Now, uh, Rothbard, who is great on the title transfer theory, tries to argue for why, and this relates to some of the debate yesterday about um, walking away and contracts. Um, uh, we, it, the body is a different type of property than acquired things. So we acquire property by appropriating it or by purchasing it. That means we, there's a thing that what used to not be owned. It was a formerly unowned resource. And now by our act of will and our physical uh, in bordering or, or possession of this object, now we have acquired it into our own ownership. Um, because of that, we're now the owner. That means you have the right to the exclusive use of that thing. You can 
consent to others using it. You can invite people, permit them to use it, or you could deny them permission to use it. And you can use it yourself um, for whatever you want. Um, but by the same token, because you acquired it, you can unacquire it. When you cease to have the desire to own it, you can abandon this thing. So the reason we can alienate title to some things that we own is because these are things that were previously unowned and that we didn't own before. So you basically undo the ownership, the acquisition of this thing. So alienation of title is not part of property rights. It's just an application of property rights to the specific type of, um, to the case of unowned objects, uh, things that were unowned. The body is a different matter. You don't really homestead your body. You don't like uh, see your body unowned one day and one day acquire it. Uh, you are a homesteader. Human beings are homesteaders. When, when we homestead objects, it is a human with a body doing the homesteading. So the body is clearly owned in a different way um, than things that we homestead. Uh, because you don't acquire your body in an act of homesteading, there's no way to undo it by an act of will. This is the reason, in my view, for inalienability. Uh, it is simply that if I say, I promise to be your slave, well, Contracts are not promises. They're not binding promises. So that mere expression of words does not give uh, rise to the right on the part of my would-be master or owner to use force against me. When he uses force against me, it's aggression, like say to keep me from running away when I change my mind. Um, now, it's only justified if it's not aggression. So it's only not aggression if it's a response to my aggression. But by just saying, I will be your slave, I didn't commit aggression against this guy. I didn't do anything like in the previous example of ready, aim, fire. Um, I didn't hurt this guy at all. And because I can't undo the ownership of my body, um, there's no title transfer either. So this, in my view, is the reason inalienability is the case for human bodies. Um, now, R Rothbard argues that it's because our will can't be alienated. Um, I think that's not correct. Um, I think that um, it's clearly the case that we can own other people's bodies like criminals, for example. You're, you're in effect asserting ownership of a criminal's body when you're defending yourself against him or when you put him in jail. He's basically a slave, even though he disagrees, right? So it's perfectly legitimate in some cases to, in effect, own someone else's body even though they disagree. So. There is no impossibility that prevents that. And if, if there's no impossibility that prevents it in the case of a crime, there's no impossibility that prevents it in the case of a voluntary, uh, say, slavery contract. The, the problem with it, as I mentioned, is that body ownership is different from ownership of external uh, resources. Um, another another uh, fallacy I've noted is the sort of sloppy, uh, imprecise way a lot of libertarians use the word fraud. Um, uh, it's used quite often as a synonym for dishonesty, but of course dishonesty is not a crime. Um, so fraud is one of these uh, vague general words that can lead to intentional or unintentional equivocation um, where uh, the libertarian will agree that uh, fraud in the technical sense is uh, a type of rights violation, although they're not really clear exactly how to define it. Um, and then later on, you know, you'll talk about a trademark case or something, and someone trying to justify modern trademark law will say, well, you know, the reason uh, Chanel can go after the knockoff Chanel bags is because the, the lady walking around with a fake Chanel bag is committing fraud. She's just a fraud. You know, people, people see and they, they think she's rich or they think she has a real Chanel bag, but she does it. She's defrauding everyone. Um, well, okay, she may be lying in that sense, but is that a type of rights violation? Is that the type of fraud we mean when we say um, libertarians are against um, uh, aggression and fraud? Um, I think what we have to do is we have to view fraud in the context of the title transfer theory of property. I'm sorry, the title transfer theory of contract. And we have to view it as basically what the common law calls theft by trick. Uh, that is the only type of fraud that is actually a rights violation. And so you can, you can think of it this way. Um, uh, I want to uh, trade my basket of apples for your, for your chicken. Um, so we're going to make a contract. And this contract is a bilateral contract. It's a, it's a double exchange. It's a two-way exchange. Some contracts can be unilateral, by the way. If I give my, 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 my nephew a $1,000 gift, 
That's a contract. It's a one-way transfer of property. It's gratuitous. It's not onerous, but it's still a contract because it's a transfer of title to property. Some contracts are one-way, and I'll get to this in a minute. This has implications for uh, another fallacy um, uh, regarding um, uh, service contracts. But um, um, in, a, in a typical exchange, a two-way exchange, apples traded for a chicken, um, there are explicit or implicit representations made by each party. Um, a contract results from communication, language, or uh, intentionality. Both parties are, are, you know, I'm saying I'm giving you my apples uh, uh, conditioned upon you're giving me your chicken. Well, this has meaning, right? The, the chicken seller is saying I'm hereby giving you title to this chicken. I'm getting rid of it. I'm abandoning it in your favor. Uh, conditioned upon you're giving me X, where X has a meaning. It means a basket of real apples, not a basket of plastic apples or a basket of rotten apples or a basket of poisoned apples. So if the seller of the apples has poisoned apples or wormy apples and he's aware of this, then when he hands the apples over and takes the chicken, he knows that he's actually not fulfilling the condition that the chicken seller is putting on the sale of the chicken. So he knows he's getting that chicken without informed consent or without the genuine consent of the seller. So basically it's theft by trick. So this is why fraud uh, is a crime. It's basically a, a way of committing a type of theft. So by his dishonesty in representing the nature of the apples that served as a condition to transfer the title to the chicken, he is basically um, uh, uh, stealing the chicken. But only in this type of case is fraud a libertarian crime. And so when people throw around, uh, uh, oh, that's fraud, that's fraud, that's fraud, you have to stop and ask, is it a case uh, of the chicken and the apples? Uh, is the Chanel bag, is, is the woman using the misrepresentation about the uh, genuineness of her purse as a means to obtain someone else's property without their genuine consent? No, she's not. So it's not a, 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 any type of fraud that can be uh, prohibited. Um, the, these, these are two fallacies um, that, that I think are kind of nice to look at uh, together um, related to the inalienability issue I talked already. So um, uh, quite often this comes up in the intellectual property context when people are trying to justify uh, intellectual property. And quite often the argument will involve um, saying that um, – try, trying to say that, well, you own your labor and therefore you own things you mix your labor with. Um, including an idea that's valuable. Uh, so the idea has value. You created it. You own your labor. Your labor is sort of embodied in this valuable idea. So you own it. This is, the, this is their argument. And to support it, which I think is nonsense, uh, you don't own your labor. Uh, but they will try to justify this by saying, well, uh, what about a service contract when you work for someone, an employment contract or a, a service? You're selling your services. How can you – so they'll say, if you, if you can sell something, you must own it. I mean, how can you sell it if you don't own it? So they'll use this to, to, to sort of sneak in the idea that, well, you must own your labor. Now, this is another confusion based upon um, a lack of understanding of the title transfer theory of contract. Really, a sale contract is not – this is, this is the danger of metaphors, okay? So we use this metaphor to say we're selling our labor, and then we start thinking, you know, it's a convenient way to describe what's going on. But it's not really a sale of labor. A labor contract is a unilateral title transfer. There's only one thing being transferred. That's the money. Now, it's not gratuitous. I'm sorry, it's not gratuitous in the case of a gift. It's conditional. So what, what's going on in an employment contract, for example, is the employer says, I own money. I hereby transfer $1,000 to you if you perform certain actions. Now, this condition could be anything. This condition could be, I hereby transfer $1,000 to you if uh, it rains tomorrow. Now, does this mean that he owns the rain? No. It's just the fact that he owns the property gives him the ability to condition uh, and to decide what conditions will trigger the alienation of that property. And the fact that the employee owns his body gives him the ability to not work unless he's induced by a conditional one-way transfer of title to money. So there are no sales of services. There are no sales of labor. Um, and the converse of this is also interesting. People will say um, 
This is, say, Walter Bloch's view. This is his argument for body alienability. He says, well, you agree that we're self-owners. That means you own your body. But if you own something, you can sell it. So this is just this sort of take it for granted idea. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think this is uh, confusing. I think that uh, ownership does not fundamentally mean the right to alienate title. Ownership means the right to use something or the right to control something. It's not by itself the right to get rid of the right to own. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it only uh, – the a consequence of having the right to control an acquired good is that you can unacquire it. That's why you can get rid of title to that, but it doesn't apply to your body. So it, I think it's actually not true that if you own something, you can sell it. Uh, okay, I mentioned this already about alienability. And I, I, th these links here are articles and uh, blog posts I've written, which I discuss a lot of this in a lot of detail. And um, as I mentioned, this is on my site. And I'd be happy to uh, uh, answer questions by email too after this if anyone wants to, um, if we don't get to discuss it in the Q&A period. Okay, here's another one. Um, some libertarians strangely will object when you say that, that uh, one libertarian view, in fact, I believe the fundamental view, is uh, that we believe in self-ownership. Um, they either are religious people thinking that you're uh, uh, taking an atheist view or they're atheists thinking you're uh, inserting a religious view. Uh, for example, I made this – just the offhand comment in an article um, that we have self-ownership. And Leland Jaeger in Liberty, uh, who's an atheist, and, and you know, I'm not – a big religious person either. So he, he, said, he, 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 he thought I was assuming that there's, you know, I have, I have a soul and the soul is the owner of this body and there's some kind of distinction between, you know, I think this is just nonsense. It's a very common sense view. Um, you don't need to be religious or atheist to believe that there's a person and there's a body. They're distinct. Just like the mind and the brain are distinct conceptual uh, entities, the mind is not the brain. I believe that you need to have a brain to have a mind, but the mind is not the brain, just like my memories are not my brain. Um, uh, uh, I don't think there are mind surgeons, there are brain surgeons, and I don't think I changed my brain, I changed my mind. I mean these are different um, conceptual entities. Um, so self-ownership simply means that my body is a scarce resource, and I get to decide who uses it rather than someone else. I mean if you, if you reject self-ownership, then you're either in favor of slavery or some kind of chaotic world of, of you know, um, um, some kind of chaotic world of war. Um, so body ownership is the fundamental libertarian view, whether you're religious or whether you're not. Um, and this is, I mean, this is not new to me, or this is an old view, and I, it's, it's shocking to me that it's controversial um, at all. Um, I just got a couple of quotes here. This is Richard Overton, 1646. To every individual's in nature is given an individual property right, property by nature, not to be invaded or usurped by any. For everyone, as he is himself, so hath a self-propriety, else he not be himself. And Locke said, uh, though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. I mean, this is not controversial in my view. Um, let me go with this, this final one here, then we can open up for questions. Uh, this is a, a, a fallacy that is um, uh, made quite often um, and is used to justify intellectual property. And as I mentioned earlier, the argument is that um, if you create something of value, you mix your labor with it, then you own it, and therefore um, uh, patents and copyrights, ideas, uh, or, or property right in those is justified. Um, so the confusion here is this. Um, Libertarians recognize that production is a valuable activity to engage in, um, and it's a source of wealth. But they all sometimes say that there are three ways of coming to own things uh, – homesteading or original appropriation, uh, contractual exchange, or production. Okay? Uh, but this is actually not true. Production is not a source of property rights. It is a source of wealth, but we have to keep these things distinct. We have to keep in mind the difference between acquiring title to property and uh, producing wealth. What does it mean to produce wealth? To produce wealth simply means to transform scarce resources into a more valuable configuration. 
Now, value is, of course, subjective. Who is it more valuable to? More valuable to you or to a potential customer. Value is not in the thing. Value is not a thing that you create, which is another mistake the Randians make. They'll say, man creates values. I don't know what that means. I've never stepped on a value. I've never seen a value. Things are valuable. I value things. You demonstrate value by, you demonstrate your preferences and that you value something by your actions. So if I, um, and, and the only way to produce is to already own the resource that you're transforming. Of course, you can't transform something that's unowned. It makes no sense. You know, if I, if I beat uh, some metal into a sword, the, the metal had to be owned by me. It was owned by me during the act of, of transformation. The reason I own the, 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 the transformed, more valuable product is because I owned the raw materials that I transformed it into. Um, um, and the reason I own the wealth is because I own this material that is more wealthy to me or more valuable to me. Hoppe notes this explicitly. One can acquire and increase wealth either through homesteading, production, and contractual exchange or by expropriating people. There's no other way to acquire wealth. But, but that doesn't mean that production is a way of creating property rights because you can't produce without owned goods in the first place. So you can think of it this way. Homesteading creates new property titles because the thing that was formerly unowned now is owned. Contract transfers existing property titles and production transforms already owned goods. They're already owned. So production cannot create property rights. Uh, Ayn Rand recognized this, and she should have recognized that her theory of intellectual property was completely inconsistent with this. She wrote herself, the power to rearrange the combinations of natural elements is the only creative power man possesses. It is an enormous and glorious power, and it is the only meaning of the concept creative. Creation does not mean the power to bring something into existence out of nothing. It means the power to bring into existence an arrangement of natural elements that had not existed before. She's actually right. This is why intellectual property is, is illegitimate. Rothbard saw this too. Um, Rothbard wrote, men find themselves in a certain environment or situation. We decide to change in some way to achieve our ends. Man can work only with the numerous elements that he finds in his environment by rearranging them in order to bring about the satisfaction of his ends. And I'll close on uh, one more slide. Rothbard is often accused of plagiarizing Ayn Rand. And of course, even if he did, that shouldn't be a crime because intellectual property is illegitimate. Um, uh, so he's often accused of, you know, when he was in Rand's circle, learning things from her and then using it later in his, um, in his theory and not giving her credit. Um, so I'll just quote Mises here on this to show that this isn't Rand's idea either. Um, he was talking about the widespread misconception about the nature of production. There is a naive view of production that regards it as the bringing into being of matter that did not pre previously exist as creation in the true sense of the word. So then he says, the role played by man in production always consists solely in combining his personal forces with the forces of nature in such a way that the cooperation leads to some particular desired arrangement of material. No human act of production amounts to more than altering the position of things in space and leaving the rest to nature. Um, and with that, I'll conclude, and I think we have time for um, Q&A.
like if you say lynching, mm -hmm. um, is very different from the order that an officer gives to a subordinate, drop the bomb. The subordinate has to obey. So the officer is clearly co liable But on the other hand, if I tell you, lynch them, it is your decision to lynch them because I have no authority over you. So what I say is simply a, a, a simply works. So there, there is a decision. And uh, the first thing here is that freedom of speech on someone's property. I don't think that being on someone's property limits your freedom of speech. All what it does is that the owner of the property may ask you to leave and not come back. Or the owner of the property may say, in my house, nobody says anything about politics, about religion, or something like that. By entering the house, you agree to this. But if there was no prior agreement, I don't see why being on someone's property you would suddenly force you to self-censorship unless customs or politeness or things like that would intervene. So all you can say is, you know, I don't like what you say, please leave. Okay, so on the, um, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a, some kind of rigorous rule that if you insult someone, they have the right to punch you. What I'm saying is in some context, the meaning of what the guy's doing is an invitation to, to a fight. Some cases, maybe not. And in the case I gave, he was actually punched, so that's an indication that this is what these guys were intending. Um, in most cases, I would agree that it's, it, it would be aggression to punch someone for an insult. But in some cases, I think you're really asking for it and you know what you're getting. And I think it can, it can rise to the level of an invitation more than just asking for it. Um, and I was just trying to give an example that in some cases, speech can um, – th that was just an example of, of, of how positive obligations can arise uh, uh, by actions or even by words in some cases. Um, so, I mean, that's, it's just an example, and if you quibble with the example, I, I'm not too concerned because, so that's fine. Um, now, I think you were question begging a little bit when you, talk, when you used the word authority with regard to the, uh, and you said has to. Now, this is a little bit of a uh, smuggling in some norms here. When you said that uh, the, 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 uh, the commander ordering someone to do something, you said he has to obey. And then you said, you implied that there's authority. There's not authority in the other place. Well, when you say there's authority and he has to, I don't know what that means, other than to justify your attributing liability to the, to the, to the, uh, to the higher up, the indirect actor in this case. Um, uh, the example, what was the example you disagreed with there? Um, uh, freedom of speech in someone's property. No, no, the, uh, uh, in, in, in the, uh, uh, Well, uh, on one side, I think that there is a clear line of liability if an officer gives an order. I agree that the subordinate could say, well, I'm going to go to jail or I'm going to face fines by well, okay. so, disobeying an order. So, so my view there, I mean, we may just disagree because I, I don't think that there's always coercion, uh, and I think that you don't have to have coercion to say that there's authority. I think that some social structures, um, uh, people cooperate with each other, and they use people as means to get things done. And there doesn't have to be coercion there to say that, uh, I mean, you know, in, in, in the military, I don't know if there's always a, a direct threat of jail if someone disobeys an order. They just say, I don't want to do that. Or are you saying that uh, you know, if, I, if, I, if I give you a gun and I say, would you please go shoot that man for me, and you go do it for me, that I'm off the hook because I, I, you didn't have to? See, I disagree with this idea that there's an intervening act of will on your part which breaks the chain of causation and all this kind of stuff. If you believe in that, there's no such thing as cooperative action or joint crime at all. But I think joint crime can happen. I think the guy that plans the, the mob heist and he sits back in his, his lair while his henchmen go out there and rob the bank, I think he's just as guilty as they are. Even, even if he's not coercing them at all, even if they have free will, even if they have the right to walk away, even if he doesn't have a contract with them. So I, I would disagree. I think that um, – and again, my point is not the particulars here. My point is that you can't have a bright line rule saying the only time you're liable for someone else's actions is if there's a contract. Um, uh, or if there's um, uh, coercion. I just think it's a more general thing than that. Now, how you apply it to particular cases, you know, we, can, we can discuss. And in fact, I think the, the view that contract um, is relevant to determining whether or not 
uh, there's causal connection between the, the indirect actor and, and the crime uh, is a, based on the misconception of the nature of contract. I mean, contract is not a binding promise. Contract is just the exchange of title to goods. But by the Austrian view of, of value, money is nothing special. Property is nothing special. It's just what we value. I mean, the woman promising sexual services to her, her lover to kill her husband is giving him something that he values. Why does it have to be a contract with, with property exchanged? So, so to, to focus, to fixate on these bright line rules like it's got to be a contract flies in the face, flies in the face of, the, of the Austrian view of subjective nature value. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot your third. Uh, oh, well, yeah, I agree with you that, that, uh, that in general it's not prohibited, but I think it's, my point was just that um, you don't have an independent right to free speech that would give you the right to go on someone's property and use it in ways that they object to, say clearly, in a, in a contract ahead of time or something like that. Um, but but just the point is that free speech is not an independent right. That, that free speech flows from your right to control your body, whatever that means. So. Any other questions? Thank you for the presentation as well. Uh, I would like to ask whether you agree to this general concept that uh, usually embodied in the concept of natural law that in order to achieve something as property, you have to have certain preconditions, like the thing has to be scarce and controllable in general. Scarce because you know, as you yourself argue in the case of property rights, intellectual property rights, the idea of doing something is not scarce or for example, you know, are also own the moon or Mars because it's not controllable with today's means uh, the uh, belonging to humanity. But having this in mind, don't you think that if, if you're supposed to subscribe to this, uh, don't you think that this a little bit contradicts actually the comparing uh, theory of, of, uh, of this clear distinction between title transfer and binding promises? And just just to give one example, you you, can, uh, you you notice that you know this saying that you sell your service as a title uh, uh, is like the same as saying you know that uh, uh, your contract will be you know that your contract will be fulfilled under the condition that it will be rain tomorrow it will rain tomorrow but you know in case of rain you usually do not control the rain while in case of service you usually control what you are able to do and what not, not able to do and even in the case of rain if you would have some means to control the rain or sun I mean, whether it will be sunny or rainy, it would be again the service contract or labor contract if you would, would agree not, not to do exact service like cleaning a window, but uh, you just will sell you a guy like two hours of, of your tomorrow's uh, day. I mean, you will agree that the guy will, will, will say to you what, what you are obliged to do. So, don't you think that this is a little bit artificial, this, this the distinction? Because, because at, the end, uh, at the end of the day, uh, service is uh, controllable and scarce because, you know, and it's related to physical objects like clean window or not, for example, or the labor contract, again, it's, it's scarce because, you know, we do not have plenty of hours for our life, you know, it's, it's, it's scarce and it's controllable because it's for you to, to decide what you will do with, with these hours, so but, but, what, what will be your moment? Okay, so, well, um, I mean, I agree completely with, with Hoppe's view of, of property acquisition and homesteading, I mean, and I think it's compatible with Rothbard and, uh, and Mises, just the idea, and yeah, yeah, I think you're right, that ownable resources have to be excludable and controllable, um, and then they're acquired, and that's how they're owned. They're, you either border them or transform them, you put up, you put up a, a fence around it, or you, um, or you possess it, and you thereby demonstrate to others that you own this thing, and they can see the, the boundaries of the own thing so they can avoid trespassing on it. Um, I don't see how that's incompatible with um, um, anything I said. The, um, uh, the, the point about the service contract, uh, yeah, you're right. The, the two cases are not the same. Um, you do have the right to control your body if you're a laborer or you're performing a service. That's why you're able to extract money from someone for it. But you don't sell it. So the thing you control is your body. You own your body. That gives you the right to perform a service. I would agree that the amount of service you can perform is scarce in that sense. The amount of time we have on the earth is scarce, but they're not technically scarce resources. Your body's a scarce resource. Um, you act with your body. You perform actions. You don't own your actions. I think it's, it's just a confusing metaphor to say we own our actions. Um, if you sell your labor to someone, you have to, there's only one thing that's being transferred. That is the money. 
the labor's not transferred. It's an action that's performed. I mean, after it's done, does the employer have your labor in its pocket or something? I mean, where's the labor? So I, I, I don't, I don't, I think there are unilateral transfers of title and there are bilateral transfers of title. They're, they're different types of contracts. Um, yes. A major problem with personal right to retribution is the transfer to a proxy in the case of murder. So I'm sure you consider it as a title to be inherited just as any other property title. But in the case where there's no offspring, uh, I guess you consider it uh, something to be homesteaded, uh, which would uh, in effect uh, render the murder, as we say in German, or uh, fair game. Uh, but how, how would this uh, title to retribution be homesteaded? Just by killing the murderer? Or by uh, being the first to claim uh, this right to retribution, does not bargain, or paradoxically by protecting the murderer uh, from other potential punishments. Well, I think, yeah, I agree in general that um, um, th that claim, it, it's, a it's a little bit of a metaphor to say it's a, ho it's a homesteadable right, but I think it's, it's, it's true because the aggressor still has no right to complain if, if, if this retaliation is carried out upon him, if the victim wanted that to happen. So I think you first look, look to the guy's will. I mean, the will would specify, even if you don't have any heirs, you might have a legatee in the will. You leave it to some agency or maybe a charitable agency that <laughs> makes money by, uh, by extracting restitution with a threat of punishment against these guys. Uh, so first you look to the will, and presumably it would, it would have heirs in the will. Uh, if there's no will, then you look to the default laws of intestacy, and, and I, there's very few people that uh, don't have someone down the chain of priorities that um, inherits their property, their estate, you know, family and then, then distant family and then uh, maybe, you know, if there's no family at all, if you, you don't know any person at all, I mean, there's something called this cheat in the, in the law where it goes to the state or if there wouldn't be a state in a private society. So I think in that case, in that final little residual case, uh, yeah, I think it would be homesteadable by anyone. So I guess the first guy that, that kills him would be the one who has homesteaded that right. Professor Kitzel, yes. could you please expand a little bit on the idea that if somebody does not give you your money back, it's not fraud, it's not theft. Okay. It's a little controversial. Yeah, I have this in here, but I didn't have time to get to it. Um, so Rothbard and Walter Block has a similar view too. Um, Rothbard in the title transfer uh, of contract article or chapter in Ethics of Liberty um, has an ex – so he's correct largely, except – uh, he has this, uh, this example of a debt contract. Um, so uh, bank loans A $1,000 on day one to be repaid with interest in a year, say $1,100. Um, now, technically, that's another confusing metaphor. It's not repaid. The, the, you can view this as a, a bilateral contract. It's, it's, a, it's a bilateral to transfer contract. On day one, $1,000 is transferred. It's unconditional. Well, the only condition is that the other guy tr makes a future title transfer of $1,100. So there are two separate title transfers. The, you, and we have to keep in mind the $1,100, I'm sorry, the initial $1,000 that is loaned, well, it's intended to be used by the borrower, right? He needs to spend it. That's why he's borrowing the money. So to spend it, to give it to someone else, he has to have title to it. So the title is 100% in this guy's hands right now. It, that can never be changed. That is a fact. A year from now, the, the title transfer that was set up a year ago of $1,100 happens. So if the, uh, if the borrower has $1,100, that $1,100 now is owned by the bank, even if it's not turned over yet. So at that point in time, the borrower is in possession of property owned by the bank. And if he refuses to turn it over, then he's committing a type of of theft or conversion. Uh, now, if he is penniless and is unable to pay, Rothbard says that technically the guy is committing implicit theft. Now, I don't know what implicit theft is, um, and therefore technically debtor's prison would be justified, although Rothbard says it's disproportionate. So he tries to sort of get out of his predicament by saying that it's technically a type of theft because the confusion here is – Rothbard, I think, here is failing to keep his own title transfer theory straight because if you say it's implicit theft, there's, there's only two possible candidates for what has been stolen. The 1100 that's owed now or the 1000 that was given earlier. 
Now, if the guy's penniless and doesn't own anything, there's no $1,100 to be stolen. I mean, it makes no sense to say you're stealing something that's non-existent. So Rothbard has to be talking about the initial 1,000. In fact, he is. Um, but that violates the idea that we have to know at any moment in time who owns something. You can't wait a year to find out who owns something. You can't retroactively go back in time, you know, like a, like a tachyon wave or something, and, and say that, well, the, the 1,000 that was loaned to the guy so he could go spend it on supplies for his, for his business venture, um, uh, really, it turns out really a year later we find out really he didn't own it because the condition wasn't satisfied. It's not true. The condition was satisfied. The condition at the time of the loan was that the borrower make a future title transfer right now, and he did that. But everyone knows the nature of human action is that the future is always uncertain. It is an implicit, inherent, unavoidable part of any future-oriented title transfer or contract that the future thing to be transferred might not exist because the future is uncertain. So it's built into the contract, the nature of the contract, that this future title transfer may not be able to happen. The borrower might die. The earth might explode. Uh, money may cease to exist. You know, he may be bankrupt, uh, etc. So. Uh, Failure to pay a loan is, in my opinion, is not theft uh, if you're bankrupt. Yeah, I, I hate to open up this can of worms, but I'll do it anyhow. Um, I'm not quite sure what it is that you mean when you say that uh, for well, each individual, I suppose, is born only in his own body. Uh, now, this is not historically true, it is not anthropologically true. Um, it does operate as a deontological uh, statement. Uh, as, for instance, when Rousseau says that everyone is born in you know, men are free, they're born in chains. So we do what you're calling attention to the contradiction between what you would like and reality. Uh, it also operates as a political statement. That is to say, if a woman says, I own my body, which means that she has a right to abortion, but I do not have a right to oppose her, or even to express an opposing opinion, because I don't own my body, I'm a male, and, and I have fewer rights than a woman. Um, now, I, I, I can understand why uh, people would take this position, arguments those who say you belong to the state, but uh, to me, it is not something which is true. We do not, in fact, own our bodies. Uh, we belong to social context. Uh, we are part of existing society. We are part of historical arrangements. Um, and in fact, most individuals do not think that they own their bodies. Uh, I, I suppose this is the argument that you use against Locke, and I think mean, very effectively saying he's traveled throughout the entire world, or much of the world, and has found very few places in which people speak of social contract as creating the communities in which they live. Um, therefore, I, I do have problems with a philosophy of liberty that is based upon what seems to me to be a an untrue assumption or an untrue premise uh, about human self-possession or that we possess our bodies. Uh, and I would say in conclusion that I can see this within a polemical framework, arguing that somebody says, oh, you belong to the state, or you don't have a right to abortion, or something like that. I can also see it as something that some people would like to see as true. It's like the, the fact that I say that God exists does not mean that he in fact exists. It means I say that God exists. If I say that all people own their own bodies, it's something I am saying. It does not necessarily make it true. Well, I'm a libertarian, um, and uh, so I'm not really trying to argue here for the libertarian view of self-ownership. I'm trying to express that that is the fundamental libertarian view. Uh, if you disagree with it, I don't think you're libertarian. Uh, now, I, I think there's a distinction between fact and value, between is and ought, and I think um, I'm not making the crude uh, uh, pro-choice argument, you know, I own my body, stay away from it. In fact, in that case, I think uh, uh, ownership of your body uh, uh, doesn't determine your position on abortion. I mean, you, you could believe the fetus has rights too. In fact, I think, yeah, yeah so, but I mean, but so as your first point, I'm not. I mean, I, I think we can clearly distinguish between fa norms and facts. Now, it is a fact that humans have direct control over their bodies. This is our nature, of course. Um, I think that that fact, as Hoppe argues, justifies the normative conclusion that you should have the legal right to control your body. 
So to own your body doesn't mean you're not a slave. It means you shouldn't be a slave. So I just think between fact and norm. I have no problem whatsoever making that distinction. So because some people are born in chains, uh, I think the fact that they have direct control over their body means they have the better claim to control their body means the slavery is unjustified. Um, doesn't mean we're not in a social context. Uh, and if you say that you, we don't own our bodies because we're in a social context, the only other choice is oh, someone else owns your body. Because your body is a scarce resource. And someone's got to decide who gets to use it. It's either you or someone else. So it's either slavery or self-ownership. And um, I believe self-ownership as a normative principle is the fundamental libertarian view and completely justified. And, um, uh, if I may make a comment, I think I find uh, Paul's remark somewhat strange. I mean, it's just a plain matter of fact that everybody does own his own body in the, same, in the sense that everybody has control over his body in a way that nobody else has control over his body. If I say I want to lift my arm up, I can lift up my arm. You cannot do this with my arm and I cannot do it with your arm. So in this sense, this is the most self-evident statement about something that exists in nature that is possible. And anyone who would deny this would contradict himself by simply opening his mouth and saying, saying this thing because I cannot make you say this, only you can make that say this. And self-ownership of our own bodies does not mean anything more than this. And this is the most evident statement that that exists. There's almost nothing that is more self-evident than this. Right, there's one more question. Can you reconcile the non-aggression principle with the idea of preemptive force? In other words, if I think uh, Iraq has weapons of mass, mass destruction which they will use against me, do I have the right to bomb the hell out of them so they won't? Well, I, I would put it in an individual context because, of course, states are illegitimate and war is always illegitimate. Um, uh, I, I deal with this in my, uh, my uh, punishment article. It's a long article from 95, I think, in the JLS, um, which talks about individual rights. And, and uh, just as I, I try to explain why fraud is, is a species of aggression, uh, whereas most libertarians just assume it. They just say that. You know, they have this litany. They'll say, well, we're against theft and fraud. But they don't really have a clear definition of what fraud is or why fraud um, is a type of aggression. Um, and as I explained, I think that if you view it in the context of, of, a, of a contractual exchange, that explains how and why fraud can be a type of aggression. Uh, and by the same context, they always say threats. So they'll say aggression, fraud, and threats, like these are separate things. Now, really, they're species of aggression. Uh, in my view, a threat is what you're talking about. So. Preemptive force would basically be uh, uh, using force against someone who is, who is a, a standing threat to you or some kind of threat to you. Uh, and the reason that threat is a type of aggression is because you have the right to respond to it. In other words, if someone is threatening to use force against you, uh, they are uh, putting you in, 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 in the civil law, this is called, um, it's actually called assault. People think assault is battery. battery. Assault and battery are two different things. Battery means physically hitting someone. Assault means attempting to aggress or batter or, or putting someone in fear of receiving a battery. So in my mind, that's what a threat is. A threat is assault, as defined in the civil law, as making someone reasonably afraid of about to be battered or, or aggressed against or attempting to do it. And by the logic of sort of reciprocity of, of my kind of estoppel argument and Hoppe's um, argumentation ethics, whatever the aggressor is doing, or whatever the threatener is doing to you, he can't object if you do the same to him. So if he is putting you in danger of receiving a battery, you can put him in danger of receiving a battery, which means to retaliate. I think you can, yes. And, and because you can, that is why it's not aggression. And that's why what his action is that you're responding to is a type of aggression. So that's my, that's my view on that.